colleges. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, he got me a, what we call a political scholarship, and it, uh, it was wonderful. It was all of $100, wow. and it, it paid for tuition back in those days for, for one semester, $100. It, yeah, obviously, in in 2004, uh, it's awfully tough to believe that $100 could buy you anything much more uh, much more than a dinner. <laughs> yeah, that's that's about the truth. Uh, and uh, did you graduate from Penn State? Yes, uh, actually, I ended up uh, deferred. Uh, the war started, of course, in '41, and I was a, a sophomore at that time. And uh, then I was accelerated. They started having uh, courses in the, s in the summertime, mm -hmm. which was not to my liking, because my predecessors in the fraternity had all learned to play golf then, that last year. But uh, not me. Uh, I, I went full-time classes and uh, graduated in October of 1943. And your degree was in what? Chemical engineering. OK. And? <coughs> Uh, that was a, a, a bachelor's degree? Yes. Did you uh, pursue education beyond that? Yes. Uh, after my uh, stint at uh, Los Alamos, uh, I used the GI Bill and went to the University of Michigan and got a master's degree again in chemical engineering okay. in 1948. Okay. Uh, from uh, Penn State, the Army. Drafted or uh, enlisted? Well, I might say that we were deferred in order to get into industry. And I left Penn State and had a, got a job in the Tidewater Associated Oil Company of Bayonne, New Jersey. Okay. And I worked on an aviation uh, gasoline program there for nine months. And then the Petroleum Administration for War uh, put out a decree that uh, you could no longer be deferred if you weren't at least 22 years old. I was 21 years and about six months, so I got my uh, draft notice uh, very shortly thereafter. Oh my God, <laughs> a critical six months. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so you you were drafted into the to the military, and by now you're you're living in New Jersey. I was living in New Jersey. Okay, and. Uh, you went to basic training where? I went to uh, Joseph T. Robinson uh, Infantry Replacement Training Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. And at what point did you get separated from all the other men that went to, uh, to uh, the Robinson Center uh, to, uh, to head towards uh, uh, the Manhattan Project? Well, they had a uh, uh, program that you could apply for Army Specialized Training Program, ASTP, or OCS. So I applied for both of those. And on the last of my uh, bivouac uh, as an infantry replacement, uh, they called me in and second lieutenant said, uh, you've been accepted in both of these programs. Uh, which would you like to do? And I remember saying, I don't know, sir, what would you do? And the lieutenant, of course, uh, smiled and said, well, he said, I had the same choice. I took ASTP first, and when that was finished, I went to OCS. So I said, I'll do the same thing, sir. So I ended up uh, it, uh, being admitted into the ASTP program and sent to Ohio State, where uh, our group of about 30 uh, lived in the football, underneath the football stands at Ohio State. Hmm. For how long? That was about an eight-week program. Okay. And during that time, I learned later that uh, there was investigation of my background uh, with the, by the FBI, and uh, there were questions asked at my hometown of Shemokin and on the campus at Penn State, and uh, apparently uh, no one told the truth. They, they, they lied for me, <laughs> and I got accepted. <laughs> well, in, in Shemokin, PA, um, anybody asking questions 
about Dan Gillespie would have automatically been known to be some kind of government <laughs> I <functionary>. guess so. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> That's probably true. Um, did you ever have any reaction from family or friends about that? That, that somebody was looking into what Dan Gillespie was like? Never did. Never heard That's that, interesting. that uh, anybody uh, questioned it at all. Mm -hmm. So after the ASTP, uh, did you then go to OCS? No, I didn't. Uh, that's when uh, we had an interview, and uh, the interviewer said, uh, we have a, a need for chemical engineers on a project which uh, would use your training. It's very secret. I can't tell you anything about it, but uh, the government would, would like you to uh, think about this and hopefully accept uh, this as a, a secret uh, assignment. And I gave it about 30 seconds and said, yeah, I'd like that because it was going to use my chemical engineering training. Any trepidation at all about a secret project? I mean, you know, somebody says, I've got something for you, a special deal for you, but you can't know what it is? No, I didn't. That didn't bother me. I, I really... Uh, the magic word was use your chemical engineering training. Okay. And I had, when I had gone into uh, the Army, I kept telling them that I wanted to, uh, I had a degree in chemical engineering and maybe I should go to the uh, chemical warfare section of the Army. And the interviewer kept saying, how are your feet? And, <laughs> and I said, my feet are fine, but let me tell you about my chemical engineering <laughs> And it just kept coming, how are your feet? And so, <laughs> you know where I ended up? <laughs> yeah. yeah. One well. aside on that was that uh, if I hadn't made that choice to go and said, no, I'm happy where I am here in the infantry and so on, my group uh, left, and it was the time of the Battle of the Bulge. And very few of those men came back. Yeah. They, they fed them right into that. Battle of the Bulge situation, which yeah. we all know what happened there. Yeah, yeah, it, it was terrible, terrible. It was very bad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Things happen in a in a certain way and for a certain reason, which we'll never understand. No, <laughs> but it, here I am sitting talking to you. There you are. There you are. Um, so when you accepted uh, this uh, this secret mission, um, what happened next? Well, we got sealed orders. Uh, there were five of us uh, GIs, and we got sealed orders and uh, uh, to proceed to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And we uh, we went there. I think we went there by by train. If that's possible. I've forgotten how we got there. Anyway, we were at Oak Ridge for about two or three weeks, and uh, we had a very secret. Uh, assignment there, we were planting trees on a, <laughs> on a muddy, muddy main street, trying to beautify the place. I know. Uh, well, was all this in, in military, uh, I mean, you were you oh, were yeah. obviously in the military, in oh, uniform yeah, and everything else. I was a private. Okay. Private, yeah. Okay. And then uh, after uh, about two weeks, as I recall, we got further sealed orders. And uh, this time I know we got on a train, we went to St. Louis, and, uh, and then we opened up another part of the orders, and uh, we boarded a troop train that was taking soldiers from, after, this is after uh, BE Day, okay. these soldiers were being transferred across the country to the Pacific War, mm -hmm. and uh, so we were, it was a very crowded condition there, and uh, we went on down, and the train stopped at Lamy, New Mexico, and uh, Say that name again. said Sorry. on our, on, on our uh, orders, get off at Lamy, New Mexico. And, and say that name again, because I'm not familiar. Lamy, L-A-M-Y, Lamy, New Mexico. We got off, and there was a shed there, and you're in the desert, and there was nothing else there. And the train started to pull out. All the guys were 
waving us to get back on that we were leaving and we just gave this yeah it's, it's an army snafu probably <laughs> but here we are we're out in the middle of a desert <laughs> and there were just the five of you there were the five of five of you got off the train in Lamey, new mexico and there was nothing nothing okay nothing there was a shed there okay and what happened next well off in the distance came a ball of dust uh, across that desert and it was a uh, an army bus and the driver said get in and they took us into Santa Fe to a very famous place now it's called 109 East Palace Avenue and there was a woman there Dorothy McKibben who welcomed all of the visitors who were headed really we found out for Los Alamos of course we didn't know where we were headed mm -hmm. so we were only there a few minutes just to check in and then she said well go outside and there's a, there's a bus waiting at the curb there. Just get aboard and uh, it'll take you where you're supposed to go. Now, you were in uniform throughout this process. Yes. And, the, and the, the bus that picked you up was clearly marked as a military vehicle. Yes, it was. And the bus that, uh, the, the place where this woman was, was that clearly marked as some kind of a military? Uh, no. It was it was just like another office. Okay. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it, it was the entry point for for Oppenheimer and Fermi and all these scientists uh, came mm. in there through their with their families and so forth, uh, and and had to be greeted there by Dorothy McKibben, and then they were. And who was Dorothy McKibben? I mean, why was she the greeter? How did she become this she, person? I don't know what that background is, but okay. uh, uh, she's written up uh, as the, the person who directed all these people up to the hill. Okay. And uh, we, we, we got on this bus and uh, it uh, went over a famous place called the Ottawa Bridge. Uh, there's a book written about the Ottawa Bridge. And there was, a, there was a house there, the house at Ottawa Bridge. There's been a... Uh, a book written about it, and in fact, uh, I learned this later that uh, it was a place where the scientists uh, loved to go, and and they had a very discreet group there to that so the scientists could talk freely among themselves away from the hill, uh, but in a in a cozy atmosphere hmm. that gave him a feeling of being away from it all and, mm -hmm. and what secrets were uh, talked about there who knows but anyway a fly on the wall right. <laughs> would have gotten a, a Harvard PhD exactly right so then we ended up uh, climbing up this uh, hit, uh, road which, which was no road at all it seemed to me at that time mm -hmm. no guardrails uh, full of rocks twisty and turny, up and up and up and up until we came to the main gate at Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. And they checked our papers again and uh, waved us on in and that's how we arrived at Los Alamos. Mm. Did you have any idea of what you were headed for at that point? No. Okay. Did you know that there was such a thing as atomic energy by that point in your life? No, I did. Okay. Um, for for the tape, describe Los Alamos. What was it like? Uh, I mean, what did you find when you entered the gates there? Oh, a lot of looked like makeshift uh, buildings thrown up in a hurry. Uh, some some uh, houses that were all prefab houses. Uh, there were big. Uh, fences around certain buildings that uh, you couldn't enter and uh, of course we were the five of us were taken immediately uh, to the barracks and uh, we were assigned uh, uh, gave us some clothing and assigned, assigned uh, to a spot in the army barracks mm -hmm. which had been built for these what they call SEDs that's uh, Special Engineering Detachment. Right. right. Now, when you said that they gave you clothes, civilian or military? 
These were all military clothes. Okay. More fatigues. Uh, oh, okay. So on. Uh, okay, because uh, no, no, I wasn't stayed. sure if they they did something to to, to you know, you know, just no, more we, military. We stayed military. That was, that, that was uh, part of the uh, interesting aspect of life up there that we were uh, we were trying to serve two masters. Mm. One one was uh, we had our sometimes civilian bosses that uh, division heads that were telling us here's what we want you to do and describing our duties and so on but we still had to uh, get back to the barracks and sometimes on Saturday scrub the barracks floor and things like that. <laughs> so we were still in the military. Okay. Uh, how much did the, the your military life impinge on the scientific work that you were doing other than the you know that you lived in a barracks and you wore a uniform and things like that beyond that was, was there other things uh, uh, that, that that affected practically nothing else okay. you know, the, uh, the goal of course was to get on with the bomb bomb and to meet meet some deadlines that had already been set by the time I got there okay so uh, the, the military did not interfere with our, if we had to work 18 hours, we worked 18 hours. Mm -hmm. and, uh, nobody said, hey, you, you were late getting into the barracks. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, but they, they got a, a, a uh, high price scientific mine for, for a precious few dollars, didn't they? 75 <laughs> <a month. laughs> Seventy-five dollars a day, once a month, was the song, as I recall. Wasn't it? There, wasn't there a song like that in in uh, one of the war movies of that era? Well, it's not a day, Bob. It's a month. Yeah, seventy-five dollars a day, once a month. Oh, once a month. I got you. Okay. Well, yeah, there good. there was a song. Yeah, yeah. once uh, a month. Yep. Yeah. Did you have any place to spend the money? Uh, no, not at. Uh, not uh, pre-detonation days. Okay. I mean, because we uh, they were very strict. Uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, supervision about and, and very limited uh, uh, ability to go into town, mm -hmm. for example. And uh, of course, there was censorship on our outgoing mail and on our incoming mail and everything else. When you say into town, where was into town? Into Santa Fe. Back into Santa Fe. Back into Santa Fe. Which was how many miles away? Uh, about 35, I think it was. On, on this mountain road. Right. right. So, right. so this was not an easy commute uh, that you would Either do. Either way, no. Uh, at, at, you know, it was probably not hardly worth it to go. <laughs> well, you're dying after a while to get get out of the. Yeah. The, the cage didn't feel in and get downtown. Were, were there uh, were there facilities at Los Alamos for recreation? Uh, at uh, you know, and, or was it all totally a work environment and a military environment? Well, there, there were some. They uh, they uh, had a theater, and they they showed mu movies. And I've forgotten how often, but. I get mixed up between uh, after the dropping of the bombs and before. I think mm -hmm. before uh, we just didn't have time for anything else but working on our jobs. Okay, let's talk about. Let, let's separate the interview out to the pre-dropping and the and the post-dropping. Okay? okay, between the time you arrived and the dropping of the bomb, why don't you give me an overview of what you did and what was going on? Okay. Uh, I was assigned to DP site. Okay. D is in David, P is in Paul, S I T E. Yeah. Th that was a building uh, that uh, where they were working on uh, various aspects of the initiator uh, of the Fat Man bomb. Now, that is the implosion type bomb. The first one being the gun type, and that one they they were very certain that that bomb would work because they were just shooting uh, uh, half of a uh, 
critical mass at the other half. And they knew when that meant uh, it was going to be uh, an explosion. So they were confident about that. But the problem was, as I gathered read later, that uh, producing the material for that bomb was, was difficult and costly. And they, in the meantime, come up, had come up with the idea of the Im implosion type bomb, where they would surround uh, plutonium with uh, high explosives, and they designed those explosives so that it would it would make a shock wave going right into the center of, of, of the bomb, and in the center was the initiator. That was the part that I was assigned to work on. Okay. The initiator, and that was going to be the source of the neutrons, which then would be released and hit the plutonium, and the atom would split, and the chain reaction would start, and within milliseconds, uh, the whole thing uh, would go critical, and you'd get the explosion and re a tremendous release of uh, energy okay. resulting in the, in the explosion. The description that you've given me sounds like at that time would have been a very, very secret matter. The, the, the description that you've given me of how these things worked and went together sounds like it's, it's information that would have been classified at, at some oh, point. Oh, definitely. Yes. Okay. At what point was it declassified so that you could talk about it and, and tell a guy like me what, what it was? Well, uh, I have to tell you that I don't know when it was declassified. In fact, in Richard Rhodes's book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, he wrote in 1986 that the initiator and the procedure for making it has yet to be declassified in 1986. Wow! So, and I have not read anything which describes uh, the exact procedure that I ended up doing. Okay. So, uh, obviously, it's uh, at some point in time, uh, somebody wrote about it, but I don't know who. Okay. Uh, and I haven't talked about it until very recently when, when I uh, wrote wrote down what I was doing and, and just in general terms how it was done. Mm -hmm. And so okay. I, I, have, I, I now can describe it, mm -hmm. uh, but only in very... Uh, okay. Let me, let me go back to a question that occurred to me when you were saying it, but I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, the DP site, what did DP stand for? Uh, do, we, do you have any idea or was it just a building designation? I just I think it was just a building designation. Okay. Uh, as you were working on this project prior to the first bomb dropping, and I'm, I'm assuming that when we talked earlier about before the bomb dropped and after, you're talking about the one the one that was fired in the desert, yes. the, the test. The Trinity test site. Right. Exactly. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the name because it wasn't going to come out of me. I couldn't yeah. remember it. Right. But uh, <clears throat> when prior to the Trinity test did you know what you were working on? Well, I, I mentioned I'm going to talk about this in my talk uh, here in, in the symposium. But uh, the most exciting thing about arriving there was to find out if you had secret clearance, which I did have, uh, you were allowed to go to something they called a colloquia, which is another fancy word for meeting. Uh -huh. And in that meeting, uh, uh, anybody with, with that clearance could go in. It was weekly, and it was led by Oppenheimer. And uh, at that point, the uh, the group leaders 
in all the different phases of this work would get up and tell where they were on the on the program and what what they're struggling with, mm -hmm. what are the problems and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so attending that would would be Enrico Fermi and Hans Bethe and George Kistiakowski and. You were traveling in fast company he for, a, for a young uh, uh, oh. scientist from Shemokin. I just, I just, it was just wonderful. And that's what I, I say it's the most exciting thing that happened when so I. So it didn't, it didn't take more than one or two of these colloquia before you had a pretty good idea of just exactly what was going on. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and it was interesting. I didn't get there to. 1945, in April of 45, but at that time, uh, and I've got the exact date now, it was May the 1st, uh, Hans Bethe had a committee on the initiator of the Fat Man Bomb, and the committee decided on one design, because before I arrived there, over the past four or five months, many people had proposed uh, designs. Sure. And they tested a lot of them, and uh, and so they. It wasn't until that May first they finally said, "Hey, we we want to shoot this thing off and test it in July." So here we are on May first. We got to go with this design, mm -hmm. and so that's what the committee uh, determined. And then they also the committee also said that uh, we will not know if it's going to be successful until we have a full-fledged chain reaction and set off a bomb. Because we can't, there's no way we can test it outside of a bomb. Mm -hmm. We need to know that, that this initiator will do its job and release the neutrons in a timely manner so that uh, the explosion will occur. Mm -hmm. So that's why they set up the Trinity tests then and they had already decided when I arrived there that there would be a test at Alamogordo, New Mexico, and, uh, on the desert. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they still didn't have an initiator. They didn't have, you know. I, they, they knew what they wanted to do, but they didn't have right. the product. And they had some good ideas how to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the idea was, uh, Hans Bader is credited for coming up with the idea of using uh, a mixture of polonium and beryllium. And beryllium would be in the form of a solid sphere, it's a metal, uh, an elemental metal, mm -hmm. and then we would somehow try to coat that with polonium, which was a radioactive uh, element also. Mm -hmm. Didn't know much about it. There, wasn't, there were only minute quantities of it available months before, and one of our speakers here is going to tell us how they developed uh, the production uh, of polonium at the Mound Laboratory in Dayton, Ohio okay. uh, by Monsanto Chemical Company. They found a way to do it, and they would ship the polonium to Los Alamos, and then it was presented to me in a beaker, dissolved, it was in, in mm -hmm. suspension, and then I, uh, I had to find a way to uh, coat that beryllium sphere with polonium, and we did that by electroplating. Okay. So that's uh, okay. That's the means. Was that uh, your development of how to do it? Uh, no, I was told. You know, I'm 22 years old. I'm I'm a fresh-faced kid coming out of Penn State, <laughs> and. Uh, no, there were brains above, way above me that said uh, the way we're going to do this, uh, I think this will work, and that is, uh, but we'll, you, you know, you're the one that's going to do it, and mm -hmm. I think we can, uh, we'll tell you if they're good or they're not good. So you set it up and, and do the electroplating, and we'll, we'll test these uh, initiators, and if they have the right background, which is very low gamma radiation. They don't want any gamma setting thing off uh, too soon. Uh, okay. But it was an alpha emitter, and so I had to be dressed in protective clothing, and I worked uh, under glass. 
but the Salfi emitter had a very short half-life and could over, only travel uh, inches, uh, uh, and so it was it was not a real real threat. Okay. But uh, I worked with rubber gloves and uh, all well, of let me program. let me ask because uh, uh, it's interesting to me from so many of these 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 kinds of projects. Did you yourself have any long-term effects from the work that you did? No. Did you know of others? Uh, well, our, our group leader wasn't working with what I was working with. That was Don Martin. And he, he was taken ill uh, with, uh, I guess it was a radium uh, sickness, and, uh, but he recovered. Uh, but, uh, he was not one of the were two deaths, of course, in Los Alamos, but uh, those, those were due to other mm -hmm. sources of uh, work, okay. working not with the material I was. So, so from the time you arrived until uh, the Trinity test was how long a period of time? I'm sorry, it, I, I it was, probably said uh, it, but I forgot it. It, it. it was about two months. Okay, that fast. Yes, fast. And. Because you'd been sitting in on these meetings, uh, on these um, colloquia, the, the colloquia, you had a pretty good idea of what, where, where you were headed. You knew the roadmap in general terms. Right. Were you surprised by by when they did it, how soon they did it, or were you aware that? No, I was aware. Uh, the, the deadlines were set uh, for that test. Okay. On uh, July 16th. Okay. Five twenty-nine and forty-five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but who was keeping track? <laughs> yeah. That's when they, they tested. Were, were it. you there, or were you no, still back? No, I was not part of the uh, the group that went to uh, okay. Alamogordo. Uh, how long after it happened were you aware that it had been successful? Uh, two hours. Okay. Because okay. what happened was, uh, I had absorbed more radiation than I should have. I, I was called the hottest man on the hill for a while. <laughs> and they, they said, you're going home for three weeks and uh, do a lot of swimming. It wasn't serious. You know, it wasn't a poisoning in my system or anything. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so they gave me three weeks furlough. So I was sitting on the bus waiting to leave that morning at the test. And the, the bus from the test site pulled up alongside of our bus, and in it was my group leader, and and he gave me a thumbs up sign and said, "Yo, V for victory," or whatever it was at that time. Great. It had gone to, but I did not hear the, I did not hear it uh, mm -hmm. at Los Alamos, okay. but it was it was heard uh, all, in, in a wide range of uh, areas. <coughs> and and. Just a, a curiosity, but where did you go on that leave, that three weeks leave? I went to Pennsylvania and saw my folks, and then we went down to the Jersey Shore, <laughs> and I did some, some uh, the swimming, swimming, <laughs> the prescribed swimming. Right, exactly. <laughs> can Can you imagine anybody today uh, involved in atomic energy being becoming the hottest man in, in his area? And being told, "Oh, go swimming for about three weeks, and right. that'll be fine." It'll, Can you imagine it'll, that? It'll, yeah, it'll, it'll go off. <laughs> oh God, that's yeah. funny. Let's talk after the after the Trinity bomb, or the Trinity test, and after the leave. Were things different at Los Alamos? Oh yes, uh, I, I'm covering that in my talk, and it, uh, I said uh, that. Uh, it was like a crashing letdown, is what someone wrote about it at Los Alamos. There was at first a, a victory celebration when we knew the uh, the bomb worked, first of all, and then when it was uh, lowered on to Nagasaki, mm -hmm. uh, just weeks later, uh, and the war, the Japanese surrendered. Um, that was uh, VJ Day. Right. We were all uh, had a celebration over that. And that, but after that, then, uh, 
First of all, Oppenheimer resigned and, and put Norris Bradbury in charge. And uh, he went back to pursue uh, some, uh, some say, some political uh, maneuverings there to try to get the, the lab uh, set up and, and, uh, for peacetime uses mm -hmm. and so on. But anyway, we, uh, at, at the hill, on the hill, it was, uh, it was an entirely different situation. We then began to work uh, five days a week. Uh, we started to work hours, uh, normal hours, and, mm -hmm. uh, and we were given some things to do, but uh, they, they weren't, they weren't, there was no pressure on After you. the excitement of what you'd been through, anything would have been a letdown. Right, exactly. Really. I mean, you know, knowing what you knew about what you were doing, uh, how could you not have been let down, even, oh, you know? Very natural. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, the, the uh, uh, a lot of the uh, s civilians, the scientists and engineers and technicians who were civilians, uh, headed out the door, out the gate, because uh, their job was over. Mm -hmm. And uh, But we in the military, we had no way to get out of there uh, because we were only earning a couple of points a, a month or something like that at, at homeland right. duty and so oh, forth. Right. They had no special uh, points for us. So what they did, uh, the military then uh, saw that the, uh, the scientists were leaving who had the experience in developing this bomb. And they say, hey, we, we need to preserve that somehow. So they came to us in the military and said, uh, we have a deal for you. <laughs> we'll uh, give you a discharge, honorable discharge at the convenience of the government, if you will sign a contract and come back to Los Alamos and work for six months as a civilian. And a lot of us took that deal. It sounded great. like a good deal to me because yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, that you went up from 75 bucks a month uh, to 150. Oh! Did you, you buy a big that? car? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So I did that, though. Mm -hmm. I, I, I took that and went, got discharged uh, from the Army in uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Oh, they made you leave to go to Fort Bliss for discharge and then come back? Well, I, I got to go home. That was part of it, too. I had three weeks to go home, say hello to your folks and so forth, and then mm -hmm. come back and report back to work, yeah. which I did. Oh, that's good. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the, the post-Trinity, uh, uh, from post-Trinity, when you came back from your leave, until... Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What was it like there then? Well, we were still uh, working on improving what we had done. There were, we had the test that was successful at, at Trinity, but uh, they were going to build more bombs mm -hmm. and uh, more material had, they were going to be shipping it out. So we were still in a wartime situation. There, there was no letdown okay. between Trinity and uh, now, VJ Day. Okay. When the, the two bombs, uh, uh, Fat Man and Little Boy, were they assembled at Los Alamos or were they assembled elsewhere? They were, ex they were all uh, fabricated, designed, fabricated, and assembled at Los Alamos. Okay. And when they were shipped, I, I, apparently it was a fairly short timetable from Trinity to Nagasaki. Right. You know, with, had, Her, with Hiroshima in between, fairly short timetable. Bang, right. bang, bang. Right. They 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 had the other bombs ready to go and were shipping ahead of you know ahead of the Trinity test. Um. Uh, when, well, first, how did you know about Hiroshima? Uh, 
when it was announced uh, by Harry S. Truman. Okay, basically through the through the news media rather than an internal channel. Yeah, that, that, that was an interesting situation. I had been I had returned then from my uh, leave, and I was in uh, in Albuquerque. I, I had hitchhiked back uh, by air. Okay. I, I was in uniform and so forth. I, I came back. Uh, and it was in Albuquerque, uh, looking for a ride back to uh, Santa Fe. And I was in having lunch, and a guy came in and sat down alongside of me and said, uh, hey, I, I, uh, what do you know about the bomb? Wasn't that something? And I, I said, uh-oh, I, I, I got a Secret Service agent here. <laughs> going to try to find out if I'm a blabbermouth or what I am. Yeah. And I looked at him very insolently and said, what, Bob? And he said, oh, you haven't read about it? It's in the paper out there. <laughs> so I went out, bought a paper, and there, there was the announcement by mm -hmm. R.E.S. that uh, we had dropped, dropped the bomb on. Were there times from the time you, you arrived in Los Alamos until you, you left, well, even after you left uh, and were discharged, when you felt like you were being tested or screened or watched uh, by security because of the, the, the exposure that you had and the, the, the job that you had? Well, mainly through the very severe uh, censorship of letters and so forth. Okay. But uh, I wasn't aware of people tailing me or I'm sure they were around in, in Santa Fe and mm -hmm. Albuquerque, and uh, they probably had agents mm -hmm. all around there during the secret part of it. You know, yeah. but I'm sure that was happening. Okay. Um, so you, you, you find out about Hiroshima on the way back from leave, but that was the bomb that everybody was sure would, would work anyway. Yeah. Uh, and you knew from the Trinity test that, that the bomb you were working on was going to work, but you were back on base when when that happened. When that happened. How did you find out about that one? Well, they, uh, they uh, told us about that. In fact, uh, not too long afterward, we got to see uh, pictures, moving pictures. They had, had filmed it of uh, Nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when they became available, why we, we were shown uh, movies of that in the, in the, in the theater. Now, you, you after Nagasaki, uh, you get this offer, an offer you can't refuse, really. Yeah. Be discharged, right. double right. your pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get a leave, a double, doubling of your pay, yeah. and you get to come back, and you had to work at least six months. Right. Did you work just six months, or were you there longer? No, I worked six months, and I ended up in, uh, in September of 46. And uh, in the meantime, I, I was looking ahead, and I uh, applied to several engineering colleges. I wanted to go back uh, to school and uh, get a master's degree. Mm -hmm. So uh, University of Michigan had acquired uh, some housing at, at Salani. Uh, from General Motors, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so they had room for me there, and so I got accepted uh, uh, at, uh, in graduate school at the uh, University of Michigan. Okay. And in September I went out. <coughs> uh, I got out of Los Alamos, and in October I was at school. <laughs> okay. Um, obviously there's a connection there uh, between your undergraduate work the work that you did in SED, and then your later, uh, your your further education in Michigan. Uh, how far along did that all carry in your life? Uh, did you work in, in related industries after you got your uh, your advanced degrees? No, I, I never uh, stayed with uh, radio chemistry or atomic chemistry okay. or any of that. Uh, I was hired out of Michigan at the end of my uh, master's 
by a process equipment company that made big big equipment for separation of solids and liquids. Okay. So uh, I had to learn all of that uh, on company time and the training program when I was a company called Dorr Oliver, mm -hmm. D-O-R-R hyphen Oliver. And I was, uh, I went to uh, Westport, Connecticut for their training program and uh, learned the test procedures and so mm -hmm. forth. And, uh, I, I only stayed with them, though, for 36 years. Oh! <laughs> Obviously, uh, a man who hops from job to job. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens today, right? Uh, very, very rarely. My, my two sons say, but Dad, what about your resume? That's the only thing on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> well, point well taken. Yeah, right. Point well taken. Um, you're a married man. Uh, you've mentioned uh, having children and so on and so forth. Uh, quite frequently, uh, that era or that time in service led many men to find their future spouse. Uh, was Were you one of those or were you married later after uh, you, you were out of the service and, and away from the project? Uh, afterward, yeah. I came out of Michigan and, and started uh, with this process equipment company out of Stamford, Connecticut. And the uh, first job they sent me on was uh, to uh, go around to 27 craft mills from Virginia to Texas. I was single and uh, had my own car. I bought a car finally, and they sent a chief chemist along with me for the first, uh, from Virginia down to Savannah, Georgia. And then he left. And I, I met my wife uh, a couple of days after he left. <laughs> when I got back home, I went back up there uh, after completing this. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, I don't believe it. He said, when I left you, you were still single. How did you end up engaged? <laughs> uh, so that would explain uh, why uh, your current address is Savannah, Georgia, I would imagine. Exactly. Uh-huh. I took took this lovely uh, Georgia peach up to Connecticut area and, uh, with this company. And she lived there 40 years. We did uh, 40 years, raised three children for an author school. Mm -hmm. And so on. And when, it, when my work period was over, I said, where would you like to go? I don't think I could guess. <laughs> I'm just Savannah, Georgia. Uh -huh. It's a beautiful city. Uh, uh, we visited there uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful city. But anyway, um, let me look here. Um, okay. Um, your chance to wrap up. Anything that I haven't asked you that you think would be important for people to have archived because that's the purpose of this project is to archive the knowledge of veterans from from all eras really uh, but but starting with world war ii veterans to archive that knowledge uh to capture it because there's there's the history that's in the history books and then there's the individual living histories so is there anything that that dan gillespie wants to have preserved for history well, there's, there's a point in my talk where I, I put on a slide showing a 22-year-old soldier, uh, very nonchalant uh, in the picture, and I, I raised the question, I said, now let me ask you, would you turn over hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of polonium uh, and, and give a laboratory to this soldier who's 22 <laughs> years old. <laughs> and and that, that's what makes America strong. I mean, that was that. The people who said, we have a job for you to do, do the best you can. We don't care you know, what, whether you're an A student or a B student or a C student. Here's the job. See if you can do it. And they gave me that chance to work on, on that very important item if that if, if we couldn't have made an initiator we'd, we'd not have had a success uh, right. of the implosion type bomb 
Right. And I, it wasn't because of anything I did. Someone else figured it all out and said, hey, uh, this is sort of mechanical ABCs uh, to do what I did. And I don't, I don't claim any no, I creativity understand. whatsoever. I said I, I was there and I was a pair of hands, and, but I was given the opportunity to, to do it. And uh, it's wonderful. Let, let me ask you one further question that, that occurred to me as you were talking. Young man, family back in Shemokin, uh, you've been on leave to visit them. Did they have any idea of what their young son was doing out there in the desert? Oh yeah, I told him what I was doing. I, I said I was driving truck. <laughs> 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 my mother said, where to? And I said, oh, you can't believe what they have you doing. It's just a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they had no, no thought. Uh, no. Uh, and, well, typical mother and dad who uh, uh, had invested a lot, uh, whether financially or, or just emotionally, in their, in their son going off to Penn State, getting yeah. his degree and so on, did it bother them at all? Or was there anything where they said, after a degree from Penn State in chemical engineering, they have you driving a truck. Was there any reaction to that? Well, my my mother just just couldn't get over that I, I was just out there driving around in a truck, and, uh, and I said, "Mother, the army does some strange things, but this is one of them." When did you make the choice that you were going to be? a truck driver for public consumption uh, and, and tell that story about driving a truck. Uh, you know, what, was there a process by which, like when you got on the train to go home for your leave? Well, actually in our letters, I, I, I was a big letter writer and my okay. mother saved all my letters. In fact, I, I, I've sent uh, a number of these letters out here uh, to uh, the Heritage Foundation here. Oh, okay. Which uh, I think is something that uh, got uh, uh, Michael intrigued uh, with with my story mm -hmm. and uh, I, I had a letter that I wrote uh, the day after the uh, the whole thing was explained uh, in the paper mm -hmm. and Harry Truman made the announcement that mm -hmm. it was his decision to drop the bomb and uh, we we're going to save hopefully up to a million American lives one of whom was my brother my older brother was poised uh, to go by glider into Japan with a howitzer and four or five other men in his battalion unit. Mm -hmm. uh, he was going to be cut loose in a, in a glider. They are going to tow two gliders, and he was going to float down there and hopefully find some place to land mm -hmm. in, on, in Japan. And he said, Brother Dan? <laughs> <laughs> you saved my bacon. <laughs> that, that's got to be special right there. That was very special. Any final comments, Dan, before I turn off the tape? Well, I think this is a worthwhile project, and I, I believe this Heritage Foundation is a good idea, too. Yeah. We understand it's, it's for our children and our grandchildren, so somebody knows what we did in World War II yeah. for the Manhattan Project. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me turn this off here.